I'll tell you what, I uh, appreciated uh, that context that Rick was using there in 2 Timothy 3. <laughs> when Paul said, knowing this, in the last days, perilous times will come. And then as Rick read all the way down, describing, and I'll point something out here. The men would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemy, going on. Unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control. Look what it says. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power, and from such people turn away. In our first hour class, we were talking a little bit about the way God sees things. You know what he told Samuel? When Samuel went down, he was supposed to pick the next king of Israel. He was sent down to the house of Jesse. He had seven sons. So the sons were brought before him, and you know, the oldest, big, strong, strapping, you know, guys. And God tells Samuel, not him. He get the next guy, not him. Get another guy. He, he's going through his sons. And God rejected every one of them that were brought before him. And Samuel is like to Jesse, you got any more sons? <laughs> he said, well, I got one more. He's out in the field tending the sheep. As you know, that, was king, that would become King David. Is David, the young son. See, God told Samuel... You're looking on the outward. I'm looking on the inward. God sees the inward man. This description of these in the perilous times, in the, end, in the last days, these people he's describing, uh, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, disobedient, thankful, unthankful, unholy, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, Having what a form of godliness? Yowzers. He's talking about people who are supposed to be his people. How many people do you know profess to know the Lord, but they sure don't live like it? Jim Spinati, you know, some of you know Jim Spinati. He did a message one time. If you was ever arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's funny. Yeah, think about that. Enough evidence to convict us of being Christian. You know, Jesus said of his followers, they would be in the world, but not of the world. Well, how in the world can you be in it and not of it? So you see, well, Jesus said, I'm not from here, I'm from above. And the people, the Jews said, say what? Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose mother is Mary, and his siblings, his brothers and sisters? What does he mean? Because Jesus said, I came down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. And they're like, came down from heaven? What is he talking about? Did he come down from heaven? But was he not born in Bethlehem? Wasn't he a baby? Didn't he grow up here? Didn't, in fact, he spend his whole time here right up until the time they crucified him? You know, when you know, he would be 33 years old, and he didn't go home on the weekends, back to heaven, I mean. You'd think in every way he was from here. He said, no, I'm not. I'm from above. He said, you're from beneath. But you know what Jesus said to his followers? You must be born again. You must be born again if you're going to go to heaven. You see that in John chapter 3. Now maybe, just maybe, you have a cross-reference in your Bible, if you've got a Bible that gives you some of those helps to give you a cross-reference. You know what born again means? It means born from above. You must be born from above. Jesus was born from above. 
He would pray in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 as he was getting ready because he knew this is the day, this is the night. They're going to come. They're going to get me. They're going to take me, beat me up, and crucify me. He's done. He told the Father, Father, I'm coming home. I fulfilled the purpose, the cause of which you sent me here to do. I accomplished the mission. I brought your word to these. These are thine. Speaking of the apostles, I'm praying for them. He said, I ain't praying for the world. I'm praying for them. In fact, he said, not only these, but for all those who will believe on me through their word. He's speaking about the apostles. It would be the apostles that would take the gospel. Jesus would say, go into all the world and preach this message. 2,000 years ago. He would say, they're not of the world, Father. As I'm not of the world. He would say in John 17, but as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Now, Peter would describe the Christian. He would say in 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts at war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles or the nations, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter describes the Christian, these people who have been born again, I didn't read that first verse in chapter 2, but Peter said, lay aside all malice, deceit, and hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, and as newborn babies, newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And then that verse 11, he referred to them Beloved, he said, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. You're in a world that's not your home anymore. Something happened. When you were born again, you were transferred from the power of darkness and into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's like Colossians 1 and 13, if you're taking notes. He has delivered us, speaking of the church, the Christian, from the power of darkness and conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You see, people don't realize the depth of what biblical Christianity was all about. It's morphed and morphed and morphed and morphed into some kind of a social thing where people just go to church on Sunday, you know, have a great time, maybe talk about, you know, I don't know, things to encourage one another. Maybe not a whole lot of scripture. I don't know. Maybe you, you can testify to this fact. I wasn't much of a church person before I was actually taught and baptized into Christ, okay? I mean, I started going to a, a church next door to where we live, but they, they didn't talk about scriptures. The young guy, the preacher there, talked about current events, basically. Uh, and uh, I've heard many people give the same kind of testimony. You know, you might get one or two scriptures. I'm going to give you a ton of scriptures. We always do. Bigger picture. A bigger picture. We want to be encouraging, but I'd rather be encouraging from a biblical perspective because as perilous times, how's your journey going so far in this world that's not your home? This is a crazy place. Gee whiz. All over the world, too. We might be having some of our own stuff here in America now, but... Man, there's people living in some very difficult situations all over the world. Really scary places where people have no rights. They're poor. They're dying and nobody cares. I mean, just don't take my word for it. Just search and look. Look around. America was always, you know, to be the place everybody wanted to come because you could be free or you had protection, rule of law and, you know, medical care, 911, you know, if you needed help, you know, medical fire or, or police and 
A lot of places they don't have that kind of stuff. You can just dial 911 if you're having a bad day. When we were on that little journey, me and Gary DiPaolo up in the northern area of Burma in the jungle, and man alive, man, I, my leg, I got this cramp, man, I, I couldn't hardly walk, and I realized, what are we going to do? Them porters are going to have to carry me. They're strong enough to do it, these little wiry guys. You know, but the last thing I wanted was them carrying my old tired self back all that down that 5,000 foot mountain we just got done walking up. That's why my leg flipped out on me. Oh man, I ever had a cramp like that in my life. Couldn't walk. So Graham cut me a couple bamboo sticks and I'm like an old guy with my little bamboo sticks. I said, how far is that village, Graham? Because the place we're gonna spend the night. Because when that sun goes down, man, that jungle, it's pitch black with tigers and wild pigs and big snakes. I didn't want to be in that jungle when that sun went down. I said, how far is that village? He said, seven miles. But man, that's seven miles through the brush, man, that ain't walking down the sidewalk. And I realized, you know what? I've never felt so helpless realizing you can't just dial Boop, 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 911, and here comes a helicopter to come get me? You know, the cavalry, maybe a fire engine, an ambulance, and who knows to rescue you. So I asked Graham, you know, after we did make it, the sun was going down, we finally got to that village. Garrett DePaolo said, he's from Montana, he lives at 5,000 feet. I'm coming from sea level. We had to hump up that mountain. Man, the air was thin to me. And Gary hikes in those mountains for fun in Montana. When we got into that village, Gary DePaolo said, this is the toughest hike I've ever been on in my life. I'm thinking, I'm 10 years older than you, man, and I don't hump around the mountains for fun in my <laughs> spare time. Man, it was rough street. But I asked Graham, I said, what do you do out here? What if a kid had a appendicitis attack in the middle of the night? Doc and P looked at me and he just said, they die. They die. We put a man on the moon 50 years ago. You got somebody dying of appendicitis in this world? Yep. You know, as Americans, we don't even think about stuff like that. You don't even think about stuff like that. Life is tough down here. We're strangers. We're, we're pilgrims. We're, we're sojourners. Those words tell you something. Basically, a pilgrim is not a refugee, but someone looking for religious freedom. That's why they called them pilgrims when they landed at Plymouth Rock. They weren't refugees. They came here for a reason. They wanted a new life in a new world. If you're a born-again Christian, hopefully that's what you came under conviction when you heard the gospel of your salvation. You saw the opportunity of a new life in a new world, in a world that's not even your home anymore. You're just a stranger, a sojourner, just passing through. We have to see ourselves that way that we are on a journey. But this journey's got some twists and turns. It's okay. It's okay. And that's why we really need to get that picture. Some people think if they become a Christian, they won't have any more problems. I don't know what Bible you're reading. There's a reason why this book is this thick. A lot of information in here. Anybody that's telling you, you become a Christian, it's, it's health and wealth and prosperity, no problems no more, they, they also got some, some uh, oceanfront property for you, they'll sell you in Arizona. It's not true. But here's the deal. We're overwhelming conquerors through the difficulties. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, he said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and so will you. Yes, it is difficult. It's supposed to be. Look, it's difficult for everybody. 
whether you're in Christ or not in Christ, this place is tough. It's not easy for anybody. You know, we could all maybe give our testimonies to that fact. I know life was, I didn't like my life. It was, I was messing it up with my drinking all the time and smoking dope and all kinds of things. You know what the Bible tells us? That the natural man comes first. You're of the world and you're worldly. The Bible tells you that. You have one man, and it's your old man. It's, it's the natural man. It's later referred to as the old man. For those who are born again, because now they have a new man. A new man. The Apostle Paul would say, you need to put off concerning your former conduct, speaking to the Christians. You know, that's who these written to. You know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing have life through his name. That's what it says. This is the message that has to be preached to the world at large. But when you turn after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're looking at the book of Acts, well, that's some call it the Acts of the Apostles or Acts of the Church. You know, some strange titles for these here Bible books. But what you get to actually see is the church that was prophesied, the kingdom of God that was prophesied began in Acts chapter 2. And then you get to see how things unfolded in the Roman Empire, the early church. You see what they did. You see what they taught. You saw people coming under conviction. So it's great. The book of Acts is great to see what all began to unfold in the first century. Now after that, obviously the book of Acts is the book of Romans. And then first and second Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians. and Fli What are those? Letters. Letters inspired though. Rick brought that out when he read that meditation this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul says all the scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. That's what scriptures are for. Now these letters Paul would say, and we'll maybe look at some verses here. Paul said, I wasn't taught this. I was given all this by revelation. He said, now when you read what I wrote, now you understand the mystery that's been concealed since the foundation of the world. I'll give you that one, being as I'm quoting it to you. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 2, if indeed, Paul said, you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. How that by revelation he, God, made known to me this mystery, as I've briefly written already, he said, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to who? His holy apostles and the prophets. Verse 9, he says, To make all see what is the fellowship of this mystery. You might have a cross-reference mystery, hidden truth. Hidden truth, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. In fact, he says to the intent that now, now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. He's talking about the angelic realm did not know what God was doing when he created this place. Because, see, there was rebellion in heaven. The earth was created for a reason. But God did not want them to understand this is their judgment. This is the judgment on the angelic realm. That gets a little deep, but it's in the scripture. According to the eternal purpose, which God accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal purpose, meaning since before the foundation of the world. And that's how he describes it. This mystery has been concealed since the foundation of the world. The angelic realm knows now it's about the judgment of those rebellious angels. But <clears throat> all these scriptures then are inspired. 
Paul said, I didn't give you this, but it's right there in the book before Galatians. Paul said what? Verse 11. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Now Paul's writing to, church, to the Christians, Galatia. The Christians. I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached by me isn't according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what he just said in Ephesians chapter 3. This is a mystery concealed from the foundation of the world. This was prophesied. The coming of the Messiah. The Christ who would come into the world and explain this to all people. But it's morphed and morphed and morphed into some kind of believe whatever. Jesus died on the cross for your sins if you believe those facts because uh, you're just a, just a sinner and uh, he loves you and so he just died for you. So when you die, you just get to go to heaven. You don't need a book that thick to tell you that. <laughs> you could write that on a three by five card. And put it in your recipe box. I say that because Sue has one of those. <laughs> it's just a little dinky little card catalog with three by five cards in it with recipes on it to tell you how to make an apple pie or something. You don't need a book this big to give you those basic facts about Jesus. What's all the rest of this stuff? Look, we're in this world and we're going through stuff and so is everybody else. And it is tough. It tells you that it's a dangerous place. Very, very difficult. But we have to see ourselves on a journey. In a world that we're just passing through. Now I want to just talk briefly then about this journey as it's described from the prophecy. And we'll go right into the New Testament. We're on a highway, a highway of holiness. It's a journey. You know, becoming a Christian is not just a single event. There is a time when you make a decision to be born again, and just like being literally born, like you were born the first time, like a, as a human baby and a, you know, you're from your mom. Well, that's an event. I mean, you know, but if you go down to maternity and look through the glass to see, you know, the, the new baby and it's laying there, looks like all the other babies, uh, all wrapped up with just a little dinky face sticking out, sound asleep. Ooh, ah. Looks just like their father. Why do you tell that? It looks like a baby. <laughs> Women all the time, they can tell you who that baby looks like. I don't see that. Looks like a baby. <laughs> that baby's got a lot of potential, but it's not realized yet. It's a baby. Helpless. But that event is not the end of it. You don't walk away and leave the baby in maternity. It goes home. And then everything begins. Talk about a new life. Oh, man, you know, we've said before, you know, when your kids are real little babies like that, here you are walking out the door with car seats and diaper bags and bottles sticking out of your pocket, 60 pounds a gear for a six-pound baby. How's that possible? They need everything. Slowly, 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 they seem like they never grow up, and then one day they're looking for car keys. Uh, and you think, how's that happen so fast? It's, 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 the event of the birth is awesome, but that's not the end. That is the beginning, and so as it is with the new birth. We already read where Peter said, as newborn babies, they've got to desire the pure milk of the word to grow. Why do you think he uses the metaphor of a human baby? Because everybody understands a human baby and how that human growth and development works. Well, it's the same with the spiritual new birth. How different is the baby's world that just came out of a womb and into the bright lights of a maternity at a hospital? What do you think they're crying for? 
you know, besides somebody just whacked them <laughs> the minute they showed up. How's that for <laughs> your new life just beginning? You get whacked. And you'd be crying. Israel, when they came out of Egypt, the first thing that you see they started doing right away was start moaning and groaning and complaining about what? The hardness of the way. God was trying to take them to a new life to bless them, but they had to sojourn after they came out of the e Egypt, out of the Red Sea. God was going to take them to that new life full of milk and honey, but they first came out into a wilderness. There was nothing out there. It was a barren and dry and thirsty land. He literally gave them water out of the rock, and as it was brought out by Jerry in the communion meditation, he gave them bread from heaven, food and water to get, get started. Man, they got sick of that. They said later, we are, we, we wish we was back in Egypt, man, when we had garlics and leeks and whatever leeks are, I have no idea. You know, and they had all they wanted of their fancy, what they, I guess, thought was good fancy food. And they said, and there's nothing out here, and we just, our soul just loathes this white bread. I mean, they didn't even have a good name for it. They called it manna. You know what manna means? It means, what is it? <laughs> Man, about the time I did that when Sue put the food on the table, and I'm looking at that going, what is that? That wouldn't go over so hot. Well, that's how they referred to what this angel food, as it said in Psalm 78. It said they ate angel food. But what they said was, what is it? And they later, they, they said, our soul just loathes this white bread. They're sick of it. Man, give us some food, man. God said, I'll give you some food. He didn't read the rest of what Jerry was reading there. God said, you want some food? Because they was wishing they had them some quail. You know, they want some. He said, I'll get you some quail. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring quail, and you're going to have it right up to your kneecaps. You'll be drowned. And then I'll tell you what, you're going to stuff that in your face until it comes out your nose. That's what he said to them, and that's just what happened. They were running around grabbing that quail when it come fluttering into the camp, and they were stuffing it in their faces. So they were puking it. God had them puking it up. Woo! Because they didn't appreciate a thing he was trying to do for them. All they could do was moan and groan and complain. All the Old Testament scriptures was pointing ahead. The time would come. The kingdom of God. Ushered in by the Messiah. Everyone was waiting for that. Now, without me unpackaging all of that because I want to go into my scriptures here, they missed it. It came. It came 2,000 years ago, brother, because you've got to understand with the kingdom of God that was prophesied, God intends to change the people here. They begin a new life here. Now, you'll look the same when you're born again of water and spirit, but you really aren't the same. If you have the faith for it, this is what this book is designed to do, is to open your understanding to what you just, if you're a Christian, what you've experienced. Most people, I'll tell you right now, that profess to be Christian, don't know that. They don't know that. Now, that sounds maybe kind of crazy. Israel missed it completely. Most people today miss it completely. They think Christianity is, you know, all about maybe... Like I said, you know, try not to do bad things. Go to church, you know, praise God, hallelujah, I don't know, whatever. Well, what about the stuff you're going through? What about every day? What about the difficulties we face? Are we just waiting for our hope in heaven when we're dead in whenever that might be for some of us? You know, the Bible says the days of a man's years be three score and ten. A score is twenty. Three score is 60, and 10 is 70. And then Moses said, but if you're strong, maybe strong, four score, 80 years. You know, I'd be totally content with that, especially helping my in-laws all the time. They're in their 90s. I don't want to be like, 
like I was in Myanmar, shuffling my feet with my walker, trying to get just across the room. No, thank you. Lord, I hope you're listening. <laughs> Hint, I want to finish strong, but I'll tell you what, I want to live here. It says we're sojourners and pilgrims, and that's good with me. I want to just get through this thing and, uh, and get on with it. Now, the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, what God many times did in prophecies, he describes something coming that would be great and wonderful, a blessing. And he made it always sound like in a real material sense, but it is in a spiritual sense, and you have to have the eyes. The New Testament reveals to you uh, the, the, those facts. In Isaiah 35, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given at the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Now strengthen them weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Now you'll see this in the New Testament. That's how you know this is a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom of God that would be here on the earth. Say to those who are fearful, who are fearful hearted, be strong, don't fear. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, with a recompense of God. He will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb will sing, water shall burst, f burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert, the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. Verse 8, the hi a highway will be there. A road, it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean won't pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks on the road, though a fool, shall not go astray. No lion will be there, or any other ravenous beast shall go upon it. It shall not be found there. The redeemed will walk there. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Woo! Man, that'd motivate you. You'd be looking forward to that, wouldn't you? That's what was being prophesied, what was coming. Some of you would recognize the fact, already I said when he says strengthen the weak hands and the feeble knees, that's right out of Hebrews chapter 12. It's about the Christian going through the sojourn is what it's all about. We're going to turn there. And then when it says the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame uh, shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb will see. That's exactly what Jesus said to the people. I'll just turn you there in Matthew chapter 11. You know, John the Baptist was the one that came to prepare the way of the Lord, right? John the Baptist and Jesus were related because John the Baptist's mom and dad, but the mom was Mary's cousin. She was old and she was barren. Couldn't have no kids. So when God, through an angel, spoke to Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, and told him, you and your wife are going to have a son. You'll name his name John. And he's going to be the one to go before the Lord. So John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. Because six months later, the angel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to have a son. Okay, so John the Baptist was a very significant individual in the Bible history. But John, because he would say, I must decrease, and he, speaking of Jesus, must increase. When Jesus began his ministry, his preaching ministry, John had already been in the wilderness of Judea telling the people, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was preparing the way. And all of Israel was going out to look at this crazy guy in the wilderness. Because it said he wore camel clothes, you know, hairy clothes like that. And said he was eating grasshoppers and honey. 
telling the people, repent. Man, if you've seen a guy like that out in the wilderness, you know, doing that, they, they were all speculating. Is this the one? You know, they believed John to be a prophet. But when Jesus came to John's baptism and was baptized in the Jordan River, John recognized him because God said, the one that you see, the, 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 the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove, he's the one you're looking for. Well, when Jesus came to be baptized, he came to John. John said, you come to me to be baptized. I need to be baptized of you. And Jesus said, allow it for now. Permit it. Let's do it. So John baptized Jesus, and here come the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. John saw it and bear witness. This is the one. But you know, you see it in the scriptures with prophets. God allows them to know what they need to know when they need to know it. He doesn't give them all the information because this information was concealed, it says, from the foundation of the world. It was hidden. John the Baptist knew what he needed to know when he needed to know. But when they put John in prison, Herod did, John sent his disciples to ask Jesus a question. And the question was in Matthew eleven three. 3, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? There was confusion amongst the Jews that there was two messiahs. The suffering messiah, uh, Messiah ben Joseph, and the reigning messiah, Messiah ben David. And Jesus responded by just giving them the quote we just read out of that Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 35 passage. Go tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus quoted Isaiah 35 to convince John the Baptist that, yes, I am the one you're waiting for. Because that prophecy is messianic. Now, I already told you in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, It tells us we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses of the Old Testament out of chapter, right here, uh, coming out of chapter 11, Hebrews 11, all the Old Testament saints uh, of the past. We're surrounded by those witnesses, Christian. We are to what? Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnared us. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. We need to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising his shame and to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin. Christian, come on. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loved, he chastened, and he scourges every son whom he received. Ah, if you endure the chastening, well, God deals with you as sons, sons and daughters. What son is there whom the father doesn't chasten? If you're without the chastisement, of which all have become partakers, well, then you are illegitimate. You're not sons. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us. We paid them respect. Shall we not much rather, more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? They indeed for a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them, but he for a prophet that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful at the present. It's painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here's your quote out of Isaiah 35. Therefore strengthen those hands that are hanging down and them feeble knees make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. In other words, whatever your problem is, you need to come down out of the bushes, out of the rough and rocky road and get down here on this path, this highway of holiness, this path that God will provide for you so that you can be healed of your dysfunctions before they get worse. You get more lame. Now, for time's sake, I'm going to have to 
pause it there. I mean, I have a lot more to show you. But my point is, a soldier and through a world that's not our home, the prophecy said it'll be on a highway of holiness. It's a place that God said, I am going to take you down a place, down a road, verse four, chapter 42 of Isaiah, verse 16. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. <clears throat> I will lead them in paths they've not known. I will make darkness light before them, the crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. You ain't never been on this journey before. You ain't never been on this journey before. God knows that because it was never revealed before. As it is now revealed, where's all that information at? In the Bible. Understand what I'm saying. Don't expect to find it in church. It's in the Bible. Do churches have Bibles? Well, generally they do. But do people read them? Are they encouraged to read it? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God, and you don't have to do it in one day. But for the rest of our lives, starting as babes, desiring the pure milk of the word, and maturing to the meat of the word, in a soldier and through a world that's not your home, growing stronger every day, you can put off, he said, now concerning your former conduct, your old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you be put on that new man created by God in true righteousness and holiness. People of the world that are only born of the flesh, they are the natural man as we all were at one time. They don't have a new man. All they have is an old man programmed by the world. If you're born again, you have a Holy Spirit. You have a new man with a new potential, but like a baby, you've got to grow. So as you sojourn through this world, man, you got way more information than the average bear to know how to handle things. Jesus said, follow me. I will show you the way. God said, I'm going to lead you down through this place. You ain't never been before. And that's what God is trying to bless his people with. So that we are prepared people for a prepared place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, he said, there are many mansions. But you gotta, we got to get through this first. So this is about being prepared to move once again into a new life, eternal life, through this journey that we have to go through. It's tough, man. Look, if you got to go through this journey, if I got to go through a dark tunnel, I want to go through the one that has light at the end of it, not more darkness. And I don't mean a freight train coming through there either, by the way. I mean everlasting life. That's the tunnel I want to go through. So if I got to go through some stuff in order to get there in this sojourn, then I'm all for it. So anyway, just trying to be encouraging this morning. So God bless you. Thank you for your attention this morning.